Why you why you care? How can we Coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada. Streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, Rumble, and Odyssey. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim. Today is February the 1st, 2024. This is episode 421 of Workshop Radio. How are all my delinquents out there this fine evening? It was a balmy 10 degrees Celsius here today. We were actually sitting outdoors with the dogs for a little while. Oh, anyway, I can't convert that into freedom units that quick. I apologize, but just let me letting you know that it's a heck of a lot warmer than it was recently. So let's open up with a rule to live by. I put it into the magic machine that just randomly spits out a number for us. It was absolutely great. <laughs> One step closer said 50. So there you go. It was 50 degrees here today, which is unheard of for the day before Groundhog Day. So there you go. All right. So we threw it into the randomizer. We pulled out a number and we got rule number 28. Make it easy to say yes when you ask for someone's help. So this is something I cannot exactly remember where I first heard it from, but I would uh, had it reinforced with myself through Jack Spearco and... Uh, Nicole Sauce on multiple occasions. And my experience has been whenever I'm ready to make a big ask of somebody, especially somebody who is probably already really busy, or this works in the content creation end of things as well. If you're reaching up to someone else with a bigger audience who tends to have a large demand on their time, make it as easy as you possibly can for them to say yes. Don't don't worry about making it hard to say no. If they're going to say no, they're going to say no. Do as much work as you can ahead of time. So here's an example. You reach out to somebody and you're like, hey, I'm wondering if you would be willing to support or promote my podcast. This new episode, I got an incredible author coming on for an interview, and I'd love to share it across the network. If that's all you ask, people might say yes, but they might say no. But more than likely, they'll say yes and then not do it because they don't have the time or the energy. So what you do You type up a blurb, a little, you know, two sentence blurb with the link and you say, hey, would you mind sharing this? When you take the work out of an ask or the difficulty, be very specific on what you're asking for. To me, that is the best way to get a yes out of somebody that you wouldn't necessarily think you would get a yes out of. So for me, rule number 28, make it easy to say yes when you ask for someone's help. Simple as that. So I got one piece of news that I caught just before I went live this evening. Uh, A member, uh, let's just say an honorary member of the workshop community, Mr. Red Green. Nope, nothing happened to him. I just realized how bad that sounded as I was talking. So Steve Smith, the comedian that plays Red Green, is being inducted into the Canadian Comedy Hall of Fame in a couple of weeks. Just wanted to shout him out because uh, what a great dude. He's one of the original handymen comes by it honestly (laughs) just a genuine down-to-earth kind of Canadian and I hope I didn't scare anybody there but what a good dude I actually reached out on a couple of occasions trying to get him on the show and sounds like he just doesn't do a lot of interviews anymore at his age so all right let's slide in I've got a short little I don't know if you want to call it precious metals report or what you'd like to call it tonight but so last week we talked a little bit about the benefits of storing precious metals at home as opposed to off-site at a, you know, a vault or something like that. And the topic came up, what about house fires? And I thought, you know, that's a darn good idea to look into because I hadn't really thought about it. And we've heard lots of stories about lots of different metals being able to melt. So here you go. This is an article from steamit.com. And it says, storing precious metals, will gold and silver survive a house fire? And uh, it says, gold's melting point. So you guys got to bear with me tonight. These temperatures are in Celsius. So do the quick modifications in your head if you need to. Gold's melting point is 1,064 Celsius. Silver, 961.8. Whereas the average house fire burns at around two-thirds that, 
600 degrees Celsius. Now, hang in there because that's not the only truth. <laughs> the maximum temperature of a fully developed building fire will rarely exceed 982 degrees Celsius. So, a little hotter than silver, a little colder than gold's melting point. So, perhaps a better question, they say, is in what state would your bullion be in and how easy would it be to find after a fire? Because we know unless perfect conditions happen, there's a really good chance that your silver or gold aren't going to turn into a liquid bullion and make a mess all over the place. So what kind of packaging are your coins in? Um, because they could melt. You know, if you keep them in those little plastic sleeves, you're going to be scraping and burning plastic off of gold and silver for, uh, you know, a week of Sundays. While your gold and silver may still be quote unquote pure after a fire, if the bullion is damaged, then the time comes, when the time comes to sell it, you may relax, you may end up receiving a little bit less money for it, which I get anyway. So how do you protect it in a fire like that? And I thought, well, good question, Tim. I bet this article is going to answer it for us. So it said a safe with a fire resistant rating will add further protection. Makes sense. However, there's a downside to fire resistant saves. They're much easier to break into. Don't know if you guys have ever seen them before or tried messing with them, but when I was in elementary school, <laughs> again, all these stupid stories, but I had a couple of buddies, AB man, Jay, good to see you. I had a couple of buddies who decided to buy a fireproof safe and they're great, but they're made out of like some sort of poly plastic type material that would actually melt, but protect the contents. Well, you could drill into them. You could cut into them. You could break it open with a sledgehammer. It wasn't worth a whole lot, but it had that fire protection ability. So they said there's a downside to fire resistant saves. They're much easier to break into. They're made completely differently. They're more about insulation from heat than attack resistance. And again, most safes are just made to keep honest people out, right? We know this. But they have vents in the back that are designed to let the heat out, which makes sense. So for the storage of gold and silver, consider an attack resistant first, fire rated second, but it's a bonus if you can get it. So in other words, most people end up losing their precious metals via theft as opposed to through fire. So if anybody was concerned about your silver and gold going up in flames in a house fire, I don't think it's really worth a whole lot of concern, to be honest. But I wanted to come back with an actual cited source so that I could share it with you guys. All right. So I actually had a follow-up comment from the community on last week's episode when we were talking about the best places to buy silver and gold. And this came from uh, Pixies, Pixie Updates on YouTube. I'm not sure who they are, but if you're listening tonight, it was great having you in here. Said buying local or on a secondary market is dangerous due to widespread counterfeiting. If you're buying bars, the only way to go is a Amp Swiss. The main dealer that gets them directly from the mint is in New Jersey. So again, I... Have never, oh, I shouldn't say this. I, I've bought silver privately at certain prepper events and that sort of thing. A place where folks are already vetted, you know, so you kind of, everybody has a bit of an in. So I'm okay with that. I've looked at silver on Facebook marketplace before, but I've never bought it. Uh, we thought about it. There's just too many chances shit could go wrong. Man, I'd love to have one of those little computers that just scan silver and tell you if it's good or bad, but you'd have to get burnt a lot of times for that to pay for itself. So anyway, if I ever buy something that I think might be a little bit sketchy, I take it into one of my local silver and gold shops and I say, hey, could you put this on the machine? Most places are really good about it because they know, you know what, maybe maybe they'll sell it to me. Maybe they won't. But yes, that is a good point from the community there. Just take a minute and think, is this too good to be true? Because if it is, you know, if you're online and there's a Wayne Gretzky rookie card that somebody is selling in gem mint condition and they want $35 for it, well, I don't think I'm going to pull the trigger on that because it's probably a reprint. Or what I like is some of the old cards that got beat up real bad. Somebody takes some time and shaves off the side just a little bit. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> anyway, just something to think about. What do we got? Let's take a look at the audience before we go into our sunshine prepper news from Willow this week. One step closer says, I lost all my gold and guns in a tragic canoe accident. You know, 
That's been happening with guns across Canada the last few years, ever since the Liberals got into power. I honestly think the solution would be to just stop getting into canoes. I think there, there seems to be something. <laughs> I don't know what happens. People get stupid. I don't know if they're drinking. And I don't know why they take all their guns with them. I just don't get it. But folks just take their guns. They go out in a canoe and whoop, there they go. And B-Man J says, I went fishing, lost all my guns when I flipped my boat. See, what are the chances of two folks in the same live stream having the same boat accident and losing their guns? I don't know. Just saying. What a weird situation to be in. And B-Man J says, you should buy gold off Team U. Just saying. You're taking your life in your own hands when you do something like that. <laughs> All right. So you guys know the story. Willow, Sunshine Prepper. Uh, we did an episode with Carrie, with Sean Mills, myself, and Nicole Sauce. We did an accelerator to kind of look at the things that she was really good at and try to push her in the right direction of doing something great. She wanted to figure out a way to kind of monetize her sunshine. So this is what we came up with. And I challenged her. I said, here's the deal. If you can get me a segment every week for three months, I will play it on the show. And she turns out to be our smiling, overly bubbly remote reporter. And she's turning out to be an incredible asset to the workshop. So let's bring up Willow and we will get her playing here. Give me a moment. And here is Willow's segment. Of course, I'm going to intro it. She's talking about the border crisis. We're not going to do it twice this week. She's going to cover it. I'm going to leave it alone. Here we go. Hello, welcome to today's Sunshine Prepper News. I'm Willow, the Sunshine Prepper, here to spread a bit of positivity on the unavoidable doom and gloom. Please join me for a big deep breath and a nice long sigh before we hop into today's topic. All right, did you know that when your brain is more oxygenated, it works better. <laughs> Some of us spend a lot of time hunched over computers all day and we're not breathing at full capacity. So you should try it sometime. It's really good for you. All right. Today's topic has recently exploded in awareness in the USA and it has great potential to shake the boat for us a bit. Dun, dun, dun. It's the border crisis. Let's lay some groundwork first. There are two ways to get into pretty much any country. The first is through legal immigration. It has a ton of steps. It takes a while. Think of it like applying for a job. If you were an employer, you would want to make sure you are hiring a good fit. Similarly, nations allow people to apply to move over here and nations prefer people with skills and economic stability, people who would be a good fit. Please realize pretty much all countries do this. The second way to get in is through illegal migration. So not immigration, but migration. And migration is pretty much when a chunk or a swath of a population relocates. Um, it's kind of like think of one way bird migration. And that's what's exploding down at the southern border. But who are these people coming across the border? The most unusual thing is recently, many of these are single fighting age men from all over the place, including countries that we're in conflict with. And you know, they just get a free, easy wave through the border for who knows how long until their asylum trial. It's almost like we thank them for breaking the law by spending our tax dollars on them. Okay, now here's a brief history to get you caught up to where things are today, where the situation has evolved to include our very own peaceful trucker protest that's headed to Texas. This is happening right now. So once upon a time, the border was a smaller problem, but still a problem. And then during the pandemic, Title 42 uh, came into place to more quickly expel migrants at the border. This was not sunshine and rainbows. It was not a nice time for anyone, um, but it is legal. And then once that expired and the status quo of Title VIII has returned, which allows for a person entering illegally to claim asylum and then to be allowed into the country and given resources to help them get by until their court date. This is getting really crazy. So some counties in Texas started declaring this an invasion back in 2002. And by late 2023, 15 counties had joined in. Texas tried to get everyone's attention, but it fell on deaf ears until Governor Abbott got creative and started busing these migrants to sanctuary cities. These are places where there is a policy, whether written or unwritten, that discourages local law enforcement from reporting the immigration status of individuals unless it involves investigation of a serious crime. Sometimes entire counties or states have declared sanctuary status. 
but the most attention has been on Chicago and New York, who are running out of places to put people. You got New York temporarily pushing 4,400 students out of their school so it could be used to house like 2,000 migrants through a storm. Chicago is going broke, spending on average $7,000 a month per migrant. Colorado struggling to keep up with trash cleanup. This whole thing is a pretty good example of idealistic policy having painful unintended consequences. All of this brings us to the present, where there exists more than ever before great potential of civil war. It almost seems unbelievable when I say it out loud, but if you look too close at what's going on, you can see it's a bit of a crisis for our constitution. The federal government has jurisdiction over the border, but Texas has a responsibility to defend its borders. Texas is stopping border patrol from coming into a state park that you have to pay to enter because border patrol is under orders to remove the razor wire that Texas has been putting up. So like all this specific in the news spat about the border, they're arguing over like 13 miles that's in a private park. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Um, so <laughs> the Supreme Court decided that Biden's jurisdiction of the border was constitutional and that Texas had to stand down. Well, Texas said, nah, bro. And so Biden then threatened to nationalize the Texas National Guard to bring them under his command. And at this point, perhaps with the encouragement of Trump, it seems that over 25 states are either pledged or actively sending their guards to Eagle Pass in Texas to stand with Texas. We have a state defying a Supreme Court order and then other states joining that state. It's kind of kind of precarious. I mean, on top of that, Border Patrol has been, in general, preventing Texas from protecting its borders by removing razor wire. And in one case, they had even used a forklift to raise the wire and let more than 300 illegals cross the border. But what can the federal government really do about this predicament? They can't afford to come across as too weak or other states will start testing other boundaries too. Will declaring the Texas Guard suddenly under control by the Fed work? This is Texas we're talking about. Well, <laughs> so far, the geriatric administration's low blow solution is to start disrupting the amount of liquid natural gas that Texas can export all under the guise of climate change. This is an attempt to put a big economic ding in Texas's wallet. Also, Europe is in critical need of these resources. So the side effect of punishing Texas for its defiance is that we're leaving our allies stranded between a pickle and a hard place. Ever since someone, someone blew up the Russian pipeline, Europe is really counting on the U.S. to help them with energy. So now we've got our own peaceful Tucker convoy headed to make sure that the people's voices are heard and that we don't want an open border. Hopefully it turns out better than the Canadian trucker protest in 2022. There's a few other angles to what's going on here, but they require a larger tinfoil hat than I have available today. That was fun. <laughs> You'll likely hear more about this story soon as it continues to unfold. But if you really want to get ahead of the gloom, my suggestion today is to buy backups. Two is one and one is none. You got to have a backup. If you can have a backup to your backup, that's even better. Just do whatever you reasonably can do today to help ensure your family's quality of life in a very volatile future. This is Willow, the Sunshine Prepper out. Well, I got to say, what I think we have here, folks, is a good old-fashioned Mexican standoff. Isn't that what they called it? <laughs> yeah. Poor, yeah. Willow did a great job covering this story. Make sure you give her a subscribe. Her link to this video is in today's description. She's doing a great job putting these together, and she is a busy individual. But she does a great job covering the news without the doom and gloom, even though, man, some of these are some deep subjects. So anyway, give her a follow. And as far as the trucker convoy, good for you, U.S. I'm happy to see it happen. Now, I'm going to say the trucker convoy in Canada was not a total failure by any means. It was the catalyst that really started bringing a lot of the provinces to drop their COVID restrictions. It really was the tipping point that brought a semblance of sanity back to Canada. And I mean a very, very small semblance. And yet they are going to make some examples out of a few of the folks. There's no doubt in my mind. There's a few that are in, that have basically been in jail since it started and they're getting ready to, I don't know, sentence them, who knows. But it all ended up 
whether or not there's going to be one or two people who are going to go to jail over the entire thing, it most definitely pushed the right buttons and rattled the right chains. So let's leave it at that. Hey, folks. <laughs> All right. Let's remember our sponsor for this evening. It's my good buddy, Joel Riles at Fortress K9. He is a literal Phoenix rising who came back from a life that was in shambles, rebuilt an incredible business and does his best to put out content that will motivate the hell out of you. So give him a follow. He's got the Protection Dog podcast. Stick him in your old ear holes and let him uh, give you a verbal kick to the behind because we all deserve one. And if we want to get good shit done, it sure as hell helps to have somebody who is a motivational speaker. So, all right, let's get this going here next. And we have... All right. This is a good one. I've got some good stories for you tonight. We're going to kind of jump over them. I'll try not to land on any one of them too quickly because you know how it is. I try to do my best to share these stories. This is one that I've had my eye on for a little while. And this section segment is called Stranger Than Fiction. This was probably the very first segment that I started in this podcast a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun. Becky and I have done a couple of these entire episodes just on this kind of stuff. So, Anyway, if anybody's heard this story, it kind of follows suit with the theme that we're talking about this evening, and that would be immigration or uh, the lack of proper immigration controls, perhaps. So here it is. This is a story from Blog TO. And for those Americans, it's not TO, it's TO for Toronto, Ontario. So there you go. Title is Staff from One Airline Continue to Mysteriously Disappear After Landing in Toronto. Now, First off, there's nothing nefarious going on here. It just seems like that this one country's airlines, people have realized that it's a fairly slick way to get into the country and then disappear or do whatever it is that they do. So let me show you the highlights of this and we'll uh, see what we can find out here. So this got on my radar, pardon the pun, of course, probably six months ago. In 2023, at least seven of the airline's crew members disappeared after landing in Canada. So these are PIA, I believe. Let me back up just a little bit here. Flight crew members working for Pakistan International Airlines continue to vanish after landing at Pearson International Airport. That's the biggest airport, at least in Toronto. And so what happens? They land, they get some downtime. They're like, hey, yeah, I'm just going to go to the bar, wink, wink. And then they never come back. So... What's going on here? Seven of the airline's crew members disappeared in 2023. There's been a couple that have disappeared uh, later on this year, early this year already. There's no failure on the part of the airline, so the airline says, as we've tried to put in the most stringent possible efforts to curtail it. Here's the, the kicker, and I see Sandy in here. I'm sure she'll understand. The laws of Canada are so liberal that those measures become counter-effective. In other words, there's really not much they can do to keep them there, which it is what it is. According to Canada's Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulations, get this, for you, yeah, Chris Dixon says disappeared. Yes, with quotation marks around it. According to Canada's Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulations, foreign nationals need not obtain a temporary resident visa if they seek to enter and remain in Canada as a flight crew member. So... They don't need a whole lot of paperwork. They just basically need a job. They're like, hey, I want to be a flight attendant. Pakistani Airlines flies into Toronto. They're like, yep, we'll see you in a few hours when the flight leaves. And they just continue to disappear. On multiple occasions, they have had to fly back short a crew member. The country doesn't want them to do it. Canada doesn't really care. And they just continue to do it. It kind of blew me out of the water. It this feels like a developing story and that we'll find out more about it as time goes on. But it's shown up probably three times now over the last six months. And I said, you know what? I just want to share it so you guys know how easy it is. If you ever wanted to come to Canada for an extended vacation, there you go. All right, Chris Dixon, let's look at the uh, community comments here. Said they basically become squatters in Canada and they can't be deported. Kind of how it works, isn't it? And one step closer says, did they have information that would put Hillary in jail? No, I think she'd be in favor of these folks. I'm pretty sure. I think she would. So let's leave that one at that. <laughs> How about uh, our buddy Elon Musk? Anybody hear what he's been up to this week? 
this one's an interesting one. Um, I don't know where everybody lands on this. I will give you my opinion because that's what I'm here to do. How implanted brain chips like Neuralink could change our lives. So this week, the very first Neuralink chip implant, whatever you want to call it, was implanted in a willing, I use that word willing, a willing human participant for the very first time. This is an article from Time. Can you even can I even call them Time Magazine anymore? Because I don't know. The only place I see magazines is at the checkout at Walmart. And from what I understand, they just put them there until the end of the week and then they throw them out. So I really don't have any idea. But let's slide in and see what we can come up with. Okay. Elon Musk announced on Monday that the first human has received a brain implant through his Neuralink startup. Now, if we stopped right there, I'd be like, man, that gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't love the idea of this kind of, you know, you, you hear about augmented reality where you wear glasses and stuff. Well, this is a legit version of augmented reality. So here's where, when I read that headline, I thought, oh, shit, stay away from me. I have no interest in that. However, again, I'm a big believer that technology is amoral and things like guns, like bombs, like anything could be good or could be bad, depending on the hands they're put in and depending on the end use of the product. So keep that in mind as we trail along just a little bit further. Neuralink's current trial, named the PRIME study, is aimed at providing individuals with quadriplegia the ability to control external devices with their thoughts. Okay, right there. I'm cool with that. I have no problem. Because number one, if somebody's quadriplegic, I mean, you go back 100, 200 years and they didn't even survive. So our modern medical system is keeping them alive longer anyhow. But if they're cognizant and of sound mind and they want to choose to try these experiments, I'm good with that. But here we go. I think at least in the immediate future, it's going to potentially revolutionize the way people with sensory or motor deficits might be able to interact with the environment and live more independently. I think that's kind of cool. I can dig that because, again, these are folks who could seriously use some independence. So these are called brain control interfaces. Sounds a little sketchy, doesn't it? So BCIs have already demonstrated the ability to help individuals to control technology with their thoughts allowing paralyzed patients to control a robotic arm or move a cursor. One recent trial even allowed a person to control a video game in their mind. Okay, so far, so good. Hang on. The person, and I like this, this is kind of interesting. The person is trained and the system is trained and the two work together. These repeatable patterns are often are being associated with actions such as opening an app, clicking, maybe moving a cursor up and down. So basically this machine, in my limited understanding, watches your brain patterns. And each time something moves or you're able to move it, it memorizes what those patterns look like. And eventually, once it sees those patterns enough, it knows, okay, I saw that brain pattern. So now let's move the cursor or the joystick to your wheelchair just a little bit ahead. Okay, so far, I'm okay with that. <laughs> now, this is where it gets into... Very weird territory. We have an issue in Canada right now, and if you guys have heard about this, about MAID, the medical assistance in dying. No matter where you stand on it, you guys know I'm a, a, you know, a moral anarchist. And so I believe that if a person has, you know, if, if they're of sound mind again, and they are in excruciating pain or whatever it happens to be, then they should have the right to be able to, you know, end their suffering on their terms. I'm good with that. But then they're getting into mental diseases and mental deficiencies. And I, anyway, just a crazy thing. So this is where this is this kind of gray area. Mood regulation. You're like, what? This took a weird turn really quick. We go from, hey, let's help folks out who are in a wheelchair to let's make people feel better. Now, not really 1984, but maybe more like Adults Huxley's A Brave New World. I don't know. Musk has long maintained that Neuralink could be used to help individuals regulate their mood and hormones. It's a breakthrough that could be of particular use for those with OCD or treatment-resistant depression. Though, throw this in there, more research is needed until it becomes a possibility. 
where do you fall on that? I mean, I don't know. That That's a tough one. And that's where you get into this really snaky kind of gray territory, isn't it? All right. Risk of implants. The brain stimulation, simulation that BCIs entail can trigger epiliform activity, a precursor to epilepsy or epileptic attacks. So again, folks who are going to take part in these trials need to know the risks of it, right? The body might try to reject the implant, just like they try to reject, say, a transplanted liver or, tech, you know, anything like that. Because of the high and still highly unknown risks associated with the implant, the process will only likely be undergone by someone who might stand to gain from the treatment, like those with incurable medical conditions. The technology might be used to allow, here, here <laughs> they always throw this at the end. You know, the most sketchy part of an article, they try to, let's just say they slide you into it. So we start with, hey, let's help people in a wheelchair. Cool. All right. Next, we go on to, hey, let's uh, let's make you feel better. Okay. And then the very last uh, paragraph, they say, the technology might be used someday to allow companies to read our minds or users to offload their memories is not happening anytime soon, somebody said, though the future is still wide open. So I don't know. What does everybody think about that? It, uh, Like I said, I'm okay with it helping other people, but then you get into this whole weird area. And again, if you're of sane mind, I don't care what you're doing, but wow, the technology is endless. Let's take a look at some of the comments we got while we were doing here. All right. Ellen Kerr says, uh, going back to the previous article, sort of similar to what happened during a military exercise in Darwin, North uh, Northern Territory, Australia. We had two Pakistani Navy ships participating in one of the crew jump ship. Again, it doesn't surprise me. The exercise was then focused on finding the sailor. He was on the run for five days in saltwater crocodile territory. Ooh. Pakistani Navy ships are no longer invited to participate in exercises in Australia anymore. I can't imagine why. That blows me away. Off-Grid Ping says, stay far away from that. Transhumanism, anyone. And Off-Grid Ping says, nothing gray about this type of technology. While there may be small wins, it's pure evil. And again, I'm cool with that. I totally see where you're coming from it. I will politely disagree simply on the fact that, again, I'm, I'm uh, you know, technology agnostic. Because I just don't want that same kind of mindset to be turned around and used against folks who to impede our freedoms. Let's put it that way. But I get it because I'm sure there are folks behind some of this stuff that don't necessarily have the most um, altruistic intentions. Let's put it that way. How's that sound? <laughs> and B-Man J, of course, technology is great till Skynet takes over. We actually, funny you mentioned that, but we actually have um, a little piece of Terminator news later on this evening. So there you go. How about next? What do we got next? This is a funny one. I thought you guys would appreciate this. I think we came up with a solution to eliminate our overuse of politicians <laughs> or um, the fact that we just have too damn many of them. Here you go. Anybody see this news story from Newsweek? You ready? <laughs> it's a good one. Missouri rule will change. Our Missouri rule change would allow senators to challenge each other to a duel. You, sir, are a scoundrel, and I would like to challenge you to a duel. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, this almost seems like, I don't know. You know how they say, uh, keep them distracted with bread and circuses? Well, this is most definitely one of the circuses, isn't it? Is it circuses or circa, circus eye? Uh, oh, boy. I don't know. Anyway, anybody catch that sign this week? It was a um, restaurant in Toronto. They put up a sign to say, uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, we had to close this evening. However, spell check or somebody who didn't maybe um, know what they were doing wrote, <laughs> due, to, <laughs> sorry, due to unforeseen circumcisions, the restaurant will be closed this evening. I don't think there should ever be anything unforeseen about a circumcision, but, you know, that's just me. Chris Dixon says, are you in control of why or how you feel better? Yes, I might expand on that just a little bit because I think I'm not quite sure. I think we're coming back at that article before, but if you can expand on it, I'll definitely talk on it. So here we go. All right. A member of the Missouri Senate has proposed a rule change that if passed would allow senators to challenge each other to a duel. I'm not really sure why I need to say it in a Southern gentleman accent, but duel just needs to be. 
Uh, Senator Nick Schroer said he wants to adopt a rule change allowing state politicians to settle grievances through physicality. <laughs> so it sounds to me like it's not just a duel, but it could be just a good old physical altercation. Now, here's what I think. If you guys have ever caught, and I'm sure you haven't, but I'm sure it's the same in the States, the Canadian Parliamentary Channel, the most boring thing in the world, except when everybody gets bent out of shape and they start harassing each other and verbally accosting one another. But you know, what's the old saying by Mike Tyson? Uh, I well, there's a few things, but uh, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And I really think that some people would just shut their fuck you know, just shut their fucking face once or twice if they ended up having the ability to turn around and get into a duel because of it. So this is kind of funny. So if a senator's honor is impugned by another senator to the point that it is beyond repair, and in order for the offended senator to gain satisfaction, such senator may rectify the perceived insult to the senator's honor by challenging the offending senator to a duel. <laughs> there you go. I love it. The trusted representative known as the second of the offended senator shall send a written challenge to the offending senator. This is all like really particularly written. The two senators shall agree to the terms of the duel, including choice of weapons, which shall be witnessed and enforced by the respective seconds. The duel shall take place in the well of the Senate at the high hour of noon on the date agreed by the parties to the duel. What I would love to see is two senators dressed up in inflatable Tyrannosaurus Rex costumes and the first person to get knocked over gets fed to the fishes. I don't know. I think it would be a lot of fun now, wouldn't it? Yes. Thank you. Chris Dixon says, give them bread and circuses and they will never revolt. Yes, that is true. B-Man J says, when does technology in business take human life? The hospital AI decides too much resources are being used to keep someone alive and AI pl pulls the plug. Yes, I don't disagree with you there at all. There we are. One step closer, and I agree completely. People are so rude because they don't fear getting punched. 100%. I think uh, some people would absolutely shut their mouth for a minute if they were afraid of getting a few teeth knocked out. B-Man J, yes, bring back duels. Watch people become better when their life is on the line. Yep, I think it would just shut folks up just a little bit now, wouldn't it? Of course it would. All right, let's move on to the final uh, news story in Stranger Than Fiction this week. So this is one. This one is probably the darkest story, maybe the one that has the most to do with prepping this evening. It kind of sucks. It was all over Reddit the last few days, and it is what it is. But let's go over it just so we know that there is a uh, – it always seems to involve the Chinese. I'm sorry. I just it, – it does, right? So – FBI director warns Chinese hackers aim to wreak havoc on U.S. critical infrastructure. So this entire article written by NBC News comes out of a, I don't know if it was a, it was a Senate or a House committee, something like that. A guy was presenting kind of his findings about Chinese hackers in North America and mostly the states. FBI director warned about the growing threat of cyber attacks, Chinese cyber attacks against electrical grids and other infrastructure. Chinese hackers are positioning on American infrastructure in preparation to wreak havoc and cause real-world harm to American citizens and communities if or when China decides the time comes to strike. So here's the thing. They're kind of in there, you know, a ghost in the machine playing with the cogs and the levers and all that shit, and they're just doing what hackers do, taking advantage of exploits, putting little packets here and there, you know, tracking software, that kind of stuff. There's been far too little public focus on Chinese hackers targeting critical infrastructure, such as these are the ones that get a little scary. Water treatment plants, electrical grids, oil and natural gas pipelines. The Justice Department and FBI announced they had disabled. This is So this is where the kind of metaphorical rubber meets the road here, folks. Chinese hacking operation that had infected hundreds of small office and home routers with botnet malware that targeted critical infrastructure. The Justice Department said the hackers, known to the private sector as Volt Typhoon, it sounds like 17-year-old boys in high school come up with that name, used privately owned small routers that were infected with KV botnet malware to conceal further Chinese hacking activities against U.S. and foreign victims. The malware enabled China. This is, yeah, here it is right here, folks. The Volt Typhoon malware enabled China to hide, among other things, pre-operational reconnaissance. In other words, 
we're checking things out ahead of time. Network exploitation against critical infrastructure like our communications, energy, transportation, water sectors, steps China was taking, in other words, to find and prepare to destroy or degrade the civilian critical infrastructure that keeps us safe and prosperous. The majority of the routers affected, now here, okay, here is a place where we can all take a note. Routers affected by the hackers were vulnerable because they'd reached end-of-life status and can no longer be supported by their manufacturers, security patches, or other software updates. Interesting, hey? So there you go. Real quick, you've got the FBI, the head of the FBI, testifying this week that Chinese hackers have infiltrated at least some known routers within the United States. They're doing pre-engagement reconnaissance to see, hey, what can we find out? What can we probe? Because again, it doesn't take taking down an entire grid. It just takes one notch in the grid to mess things up royally. So just something to be aware of. These are the type of reasons we prep. Hopefully we never, ever have to deal with shit like this. I know personally, these are the type of stories that Becky and I talk about. This is how it goes at home in the evening. She's like, honey, have you heard about this yet? And I'm like, I have not. Holy, yeah. And then, so I do some digging, and then I, in in my mind, I, and it's going to be hard to believe, but I think I'm an optimist. I try to be an optimist, and so I typically tell Becky, yeah, it's either something to be worried about, it's either something not to be worried about. Like, back in February of 2020, when Doc Bones was talking about this weird China, Chinese flu thing that was coming around, that was something to pay attention to. So, all right, here we go. Chris Dixon just said, I need to cover here. I will. You know what? This is really funny. I really should have covered this article. So let's take a look at what folks have to say here. And Dixon says, you need to cover the Telegraph article about how growing your own food has a five times larger carbon footprint than conventional procedures. Shake my head. Damn it. I read that article this week and it was so bad. Actually, I've got one for you that's going to be just about as good at the end here that was submitted to me um, through email. I just got to shout out, guys. This show has been taking off like crazy. I've been getting a ton of backdoor, backdoor action. Oh, my God, Tim, that sounds awful. I've been getting all kinds of stuff from folks who have been sending it along like, hey, Tim, have you seen this? Or have you heard about this? Or here's my personal experience. So I know it's going to be a whole week away, but I will cover this article next week for you, Dixon. Absolutely. I think that's great. And I did, I did read that article this week. It just didn't quite make the cut. So... That is the end of Stranger Than Fiction, because my goodness, isn't life sometimes stranger than something you could write up now, isn't it? Let's go back real quick and take a look at what the folks had to say about those last couple of articles. Jeff Stark. I like that. It looks like a blue moose in your, uh, your uh, profile photo there. He said, is that the same FBI that swore Trump was a Russian asset? <laughs> touche, brother, touche. I mean, it's the same Ruby Ridge, uh, you know, right? So there you go. I don't know. Anyway, yes, it is. Who knows? Just wanted to put it out there that they're actually talking. I mean, this is the same U.S. government that had folks in it saying that aliens were 100% real and that we had them. I don't know. We'll see. Here we are. Move on. Ellen Kerr says, so many personal data breaches happening over the last few months as well. That is 100% true. I prob I know I've shared the story before, but... Our really only bookstore in Canada is known as Indigo. They own Indigo, Chapters, Kohl's, and a few other ones. They were a victim of, again, what do you want to call it? Like uh, cyber hacking slash ransomware. And they, I don't think they ever paid for it. They had to rebuild their customer database from scratch. They were doing handwritten receipts for an entire month last summer. So that tells you, holy crap. Anyway. Hey, Digger, good to see you in here. Um, just showed up a little bit late. We love having you in either way. So there you go. That was Stranger Than Fiction for this week. I've got some good little clips here coming up for you, though. So next, we got Workshop Wasteland. And for those who are listening to the show for the very first time, this is probably one of my favorite segments because, you know, I'm kind of, well, number one, it's my show and I get to talk about everything I want to talk about. And if people don't listen, that's on me. That's my responsibility. But Folks around here seem to dig a little bit about 
dystopian and post-apocalyptic books and movies and TV shows. So I always like to touch on things a bit. Becky and I haven't had a chance to watch this yet, and I don't think anybody else in here probably has either, but I'd love to know someone's thoughts on it because uh, inverse.com says Netflix just quietly released the best sci-fi dystopia of the year. Hadn't heard of it. Looks interesting. They said uh, Netflix has the habit of acquiring promising titles only to dump them into its catalog without a whiff of promotion. That is probably one of the biggest downfalls of streaming. I heard somebody say the other day, net, being Netflix famous is the weirdest thing in the world because for two weeks, the entire world wants to hear what you have to say. And then on day 15, nobody cares and you move on. It's like uh, Andy Warhol's 15 minutes of fame on steroids. That's what it's like. All right. Netflix recent acquisitions, few are more deserving of a platform than this new thriller called The Kitchen. Cementing a vision of dystopian near future London alongside an unconventional tale of found family. Now, you had me at London. I've been a sucker for British films over the years. I don't know why. I love the British slang. I love the British kind of ghetto areas. All of that. <laughs> all right. And now this might be a weird one, but the guy writing the article says it's uh, Blowcamp-esque. Now, you might say, well, who is that? Neil Blowcamp. He did Chappie. He did all oh, the movie with Matt Damon, which I can't remember. But what he has this ability of doing is these crazy South African <sighs> urban decay movies. So this has that feel. So I'm really remotely kind of cautiously optimistic. Thank you, District 9. That's another one he did. Yep. Some days my mind works great. And other days I have so many things running around that the uh, hamster gets tired and says, I'm hopping off, Tim. You got this on your own today, baby. All right. The kitchen is a powder keg ready to explode, a housing project on London's South Bank. The domain is one of the last bastions of resistance to the gentrification that's chewed up the city from the inside and spat out a sprawling cubist monstrosity. Whoever wrote that, if it wasn't AI, they deserve a, they must be getting paid by the syllable because that was a mouthful. So it sounds a little bit like Dread, Judge Dread meets Children of Men meets a whole bunch of other films. So it, it, to me, sounds like it'll be right up my alley. Haven't watched it yet. Just wanted to share with you guys that this was something new. That's as much as we're going to talk about that one. We got four things to touch on in Workshop Wasteland this evening. Jeff Stark says, Tim's show, and that's why I'm here. Winky face. <laughs> yes, that's for everybody in the audio, in case you didn't know. I'm, I'm going to translate emojis from now on as well. All right, this is a good one here. Now, you might, okay, hang on. Is that really Glenn from Walking Dead and Bella from Twilight? Yep, it is. Love Me is a surprisingly gentle vision of the apocalypse. Here's yet another one. This one premiered at Sundance Film Festival this week. This is also from inverse.com. They said, I, I'm not going to go deep into this. Actually, you know what? Let's forego the article, and I'm just going to give you an overview of it. If you guys... it. I don't even know where to start with it, but <laughs> there was a movie called Her a few years ago that had Joaquin Phoenix in it. And then um, this has a bit of that. The world has ended. Apparently, Glenn from The Walking Dead is all of human knowledge in a piece of software. And Bella is a satellite. I don't know. It sounds messed up, but they fall in love. And then eventually they become real people. And I don't know. A weird story. It's probably way more esoteric than most folks out there would care to watch. I'm sure Mama and I will watch this at some time. I will give you my thoughts on it so that you don't have to watch it. But it is, uh, it's different. It's a bit like Wally meets her meets, I, I don't even know where to go with it. <laughs> Just, you know, the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. It's going to be a messed up one. Let's move on to something more fun. How about Terminator 7, folks? Yeah, did you know there's been six Terminator movies? Two that are good, one that was okay, a TV show that was all right, a book that was okay. You know how it is, right? But two absolute stinkers. The last two were so bad. Actually, back up. The last three were so bad, I don't even want to pretend like they happened. Now, this is not super great news, but it's something, and I was kind of excited. James Cameron has announced he's currently working on a script for Terminator 7. 
Now, I was really excited when James Cameron announced a few years ago that he was working on a script for Terminator 6 until I watched Terminator 6 and realized even James Cameron couldn't save that franchise. Do we need another one? No. Will I still go and watch it? Yep, I will. Simple as that. <laughs> That's my problem. I don't know what it is. You know, there you go. So uh, even with the promising news, there are setbacks. As Cameron himself has admitted, he's taking his time. Cameron has been somewhat vocal about the franchise he helped create. And this is kind of cool. I like this part. And you guys, you know, this is where we talked about it earlier. Cameron has been somewhat vocal about the franchise and his plan for resurrecting the dying series is through the exploration of artificial intelligence in the modern context. Along with the hint that he was still working on the script, Cameron also made it clear he was waiting for more developments in modern AI to help inform his story. Will we ever see one? I don't know. It would sure, man, between Terminator Salvation, Terminator Genesis, and whatever the hell Terminator 6 was called, Terminator 6 goes woke, goes broke, and there you go. Uh, no, it was it was like uh, a soft reboot Terminator 6 was. It was kind of similar to the latest trilogy of Star Wars movie. It just didn't work. Where they go with it, I don't know. But I thought I'd share that little tidbit of news. It might anybody out there who's a post-apocalyptic fanboy for, you know, aging Arnold Schwarzenegger, this might be something up your alley. And finally, couldn't leave workshop wasteland without an update on 28 years later because holy cow i'm excited i know i know i know tim don't get so damn excited you're an incurable optimist you're going to pay for this when the movie comes out and it's awful we're all going to throw tomatoes at you and tell you how bad it anyway there you go zombie sequel 28 days later lands at sony this is from the hollywood reporter they put it up for bid they spent a few days throwing a whole bunch of money around like hollywood does and eventually sony got the rights the other part of the story is that Cillian Murphy, or Killian Murphy, I forget, I apologize to nobody, whose career was launched thanks to the original movie, is also returning as an executive producer. However, the Oppenheimer star could also possibly act in the project, although details are being quarantined. I think a dad wrote this article, because that was definitely a dad joke right there. But we go from a possible Terminator 7 that maybe nobody ever wants to a 28 years later sequel who brings back the original writer, the original author, the original director, and possibly the original star. What could go wrong in today's modern cinematic landscape? Absolutely nothing. Everybody, everything will be fine. I promise. Yeah, that's it from Workshop Wasteland this week, folks. It wasn't that much. Hope you're enjoying it. I got a good one for you. So last week's, I ended up clipping my segment of, I read it from the internet, and I want to tell you some fun stuff. So I don't know if you guys remember the article last week, but it was about a guy who had, uh, I think he was a bit uh, autistic maybe, and he said that his mother stole all his preps and sold them. I ended up clipping that. It became a, not that big of a deal, but it caught some traction on YouTube and on TikTok. And afterwards, I thought, oh, I really hope my mom doesn't see that because uh, she might think I was <laughs> telling stories about her. However, a lot of folks were like, your mom really did that? Or really? That's the case? I was like, anyway, I guess I should have been slightly more careful with the 60 seconds I chose to chop out of last week's episode. However, I read it on the internet is our weekly segment where I pick the top trending article from Reddit from last week in our preppers that is pertinent to us. This is a good one, guys. This is titled, A Prep Saved My Family Today. And this is from Anthropic Principle. That's the user. Got to give credit. I want to make sure that people know this. So I read it on the internet. A Prep Saved My Family Today. I'm a contractor. I use a fold-down extendable grill ladder on job sites. A tool of my, a, a lot of my tools I will leave on jobs in the evenings and weekends but not my ladder or compressor. He sounds like how I treat my impact driver. So today, now see if you can figure out, I want you guys to see if you can guess where this story is going before we get there. You don't have to type it. You can, if you want. Today, I ran to get tortilla chips. Probably would have been faster if he drove, but that's his first mistake before the big game. On my way home, I get a phone call from my wife. She'd taken the kiddos and the dog for a walk. During the walk, the dog got away from her 
and ran onto a frozen beaver pond with lots of cattails. The ice kept breaking and the dog got stuck where she couldn't be seen. She was in distress and my wife needed my help. I get there immediately. I find my wife. Oh man, this is crazy. Anyway, I found my wife went looking for the dog, found it and went through the ice neck deep with the dog. She pushed the dog out of the water onto the cattail island and managed to get herself out of the water and onto the island as well. Her phone was submerged. Her and the dog are wet and stuck 14 feet from the beaver dam. Ooh. I got my ladder. I extended it as far as I could. I climbed across the dam as close as I could get to them. I let the ladder fall. It landed in the cattails next to them and was just long enough to span the little ice cattail island to the dam. <laughs> I walked across first and I carried the dog back to the beaver dam. Then I went back and helped my frozen wet wife across the ladder. Everyone's fine and warm. Dog seems to have a little PTSD and she's very clingy. Some lessons were learned, but all is well. Takeaway, it's the little things, the ones you think I probably won't use or need that. The things that once you need and don't have, you might just be calling the fire department. Well, what do you think about that? My first thoughts were, buddy, you saved your dog before you saved your wife. Somebody's going to be in the dog house this week. However, I got to say, it was a pretty ingenious use of a folding ladder. I liked it. I'm glad you figured it out. I love, these are the true prepping stories, right? These are the things that it's about a mindset because again, he didn't panic. He grabbed something that worked. He turned it into a solution and he moved on. Lots of folks could have had a whole bunch of stuff around and ended up being panicked, so panicked that they can't figure it out. Remember training, that kind of stuff. The dude was used to using the ladder. He made the right choice. Even if he did save his dog first, I don't know. I, I yeah. <sighs> Number two, and I love my dogs to death, but I think the lady probably panicked a bit and she wanted to save her dog and she ended up putting herself into a much worse situation. If she'd give us some thought for just a little while, maybe she would not uh, have ended up neck deep into ice, you know, frigid water, but whatever, you know what? It worked out great. The dude got to use something that he always brought home. That's like the prepper equivalent of always making sure your gas tank's full before you go home at night. Last night, I got back from Wainwright with Charlotte, took her to volleyball practice, her and her friend. We dropped her friend off and she was like, well, where are we going? I thought we were heading home. I said, nope, not before we don't go get, or not before we don't go to the gas station and gas up. So I did. Half a tank is empty. So there you go. A couple of thoughts from the Reddit community last this week. Somebody said, glad you guys are okay. And I like this. Our, our sponsor, Joel, would have been a big fan of this, said dog training is prepping as well. There'll never be a day or a circumstance where I do not reward my dogs for coming when I call them. Also, something else I hadn't thought of, front paw, front paw attached dew claws are also helpful for situations like this as well. Dogs have a much easier time pulling themselves out of water onto ice when they have them intact. A lot of breeders remove them just in case they ever get torn or injured, but they have a function. I learned something new today because we've had our dew claws removed on a few of our chihuahuas because being, you know, the majority indoor dogs, they tend to grow into their paw really quick. And we thought we were doing them a favor. Not that I think a chihuahua could probably pull themselves out of an icy bath. Anyhow, they would just lay on their back, accept their lot in life and say, dad, save me or I'm going down. And one more here said, dude, listen, I'm super proud of you. You did amazing. But next time you should call emergency services first and explain what's going on before you yourself go on the ladder in case you all get stuck or at least your nearest neighbors. Someone should know. I agree. He probably should have sent someone to call 911, but I can also tell you that my ass wouldn't be standing by waiting for someone else to come and save my dog and my wife. But he did give one more update and said neighbors had come to watch the show. Everyone was quite ready to call the fire department if need be. There you go. I thought that was a feel good story where a dog got saved and a wife was last. I mean, that's awful. I can't even imagine. <laughs> there you go. So, all right, next, what do I got next for you? Guess what, folks? It's time for cookbook of the collapse. I like this one. This one's become a really fun one. And guess what? This today, I have our very first submission from the community. The first three or four were from myself and my extended family. I've had a bunch of people reach out, keep sending them because 
This one comes from Jim Tubbs of Sawhorse Stables Woodcraft. He sent me two, so I've got two from him, but I'm only going to share one tonight. And again, folks ask, what is the requirement for Cookbook of the Collapse? Well, a few things. Once we hit 100 recipes, I'm going to put them together. We're going to make a community cookbook. It's going to be fun. Number two, I would like them to be something that we can, that could be made from your preps. That's the next thing. So this one's simple. You'll like it. From Jim, flour tortillas. Simple. I like it. A cup of all-purpose flour, a cup of warm water, a third a cup of vegetable oil, a teaspoon of salt, and a tablespoon of baking powder. Combine the dry ingredients in a bowl. Add the water, the, ve the vegetable oil to the dry ingredients. Mix until it forms a uh, smooth dough. Turn the dough out onto a well-floured surface. Divide the dough into 15 equal parts. I've never made these quite. I like this. Anyway, form each ball. Uh, form each into a ball. Flatten with your palm. Coat the pieces in flour and let them rest under a towel for a half hour to two hours. The dough is ready when it can be rolled out without shrinking back. Heat a dry pan over medium heat. Roll the dough into thin rounds. Cook the tortillas in a pan for one minute each side. And serve. This is the best part. <laughs> Serve with your favorite taco or fajita ingredients. You can also make larger shells for wraps or burritos, and the shells can be deep fried for chips or whole and then topped with cinnamon sugar for a delicious treat. You can also freeze the shells or doughs prior to cooking or after. How simple is that? How great would some freeze-dried hamburger and some homemade tortillas from a five-gallon bucket that you stored five years ago taste when... The grocery stores don't have any food. I love it. Also, what a great skill to learn ahead of time in case there ever was something bad happen. This is the type of stuff that I've taught my girls over the years how to cook. And this is one we're going to try out. I love it. We, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about dry goods storage here tonight because Becky and I have decided to uh, complete what we started last winter. So we'll talk about that. But Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate it. So check him out, Jim Tubbs at Sawhorse Stables Woodcraft. Also, you're like, Tim, you spoke too fast. I couldn't get the recipe. It's in the notes tonight. So if you want the recipe, you can copy and paste it from wherever you happen to be. One Step Closer says, fry the dough from flour tortilla to make oh, sopapillas, a nice treat with honey. I am sure I absolutely butchered that. I I apologize, but that sounds really good. I like that. I know, carb heavy, but here's the deal. <sighs> Post collapse, if you're living off your preps, there's a good chance you're going to have quite a bit of carbs. That's one of the main reasons that I've been going balls to the wall with the freeze dryer is I want to add protein to it. So then our only deficiency will be fat. And I got a lot of that to spare. So we're okay for a little while. All right, next is this week in the workshop, folks. I like this segment where I get to slow down just a little and share with you exactly what I've been up to this week. And there's a few, uh, the reason I do it is twofold. Number one, hopefully to inspire other folks to try things that they might be slightly adverse to trying. But number two, to give me a bit of accountability mm -hmm. so that you're like, oh yeah, Tim didn't do much this week, did he? That lazy bastard. Anyway, <laughs> so there you go. I spent two days working on punch lists up at the daycare uh, in Lloyd Minster. Got a ton done. Let's see. I fixed some loose taps. I hung a new blind. I run some new network cables. I changed out a couple of automatic locks. I hung some cork boards, and I fixed a wobbly table. I had a hell of a time. It was so much fun. I went in. I was getting ready to hang a cork board, and the little kid said, Tim, how are you? Can you fix our table? We were dancing on it, and we made it wobbly. <laughs> So I got to do that. That's probably my favorite part of going to the daycares, hanging out with the kids there. They crack me up. I'm glad that I can leave them there and go home after an hour or two, but you know, <laughs> here's one for you. Always check the clearance racks at Home Depot. I was up there last week or early this week. And I always take that route toward the back because they don't put them in obvious places. They usually have them on the back end aisle facing the opposite direction of the store. Well, I went in and I managed to find, it was either five or six padlocks. Three of them were smart keys. And if you've heard me recommend smart keys before, I like them because anybody can rekey them if you have the master key. I hadn't seen padlocks that were rekeyable using the smart key. So I picked those up, 10 bucks a piece, regular price, $40. And then I also picked up three, what I call combination padlocks. They look like a key lock, but underneath they have that, the dial. 
Super easy again to rekey. Got three of those, regular 40 bucks, on for 10. So don't ever leave Home Depot or Lowe's, even though we don't have them anymore, without going by the clearance rack. You might find something. How about we had a massive freezing at a rental that I didn't catch for almost a week. So I was checking on an empty rental. I did before the deep freeze, and then I'd forgotten that the person hadn't moved in yet. And I went over to check on it one day, opened the door, and it sounded like somebody had left the basement tap running. We ended up having four breaks in the pipes. Didn't do a stitch of damage to the house, thank God. It was all in a crawl space and in the basement that's just a cement floor. So I'm sure the water bill will be a little bit high, but thank goodness we didn't have uh, a serious issue there. I spent the whole day Saturday replumbing the entire basement, which really sucked because you only had two places to access the pipes. One was a maybe a 12 by 18 panel behind the, the shower, which was cool. The other one was a hole smaller than my head. Now I do have a big head, I know, that had been pounded through the concrete. So any new pipe I wanted to run through there, I had to fish from one end to the other, moving right along. However, it was an excuse to buy a new tool. And if you don't have one of these and you have to cut copper pipe on any amount of time, you should get one. I should have brought it downstairs. It looks like a C-clamp. It fits onto the pipe and it's spring loaded. So you don't have to tighten anything as you turn it. It applies the pressure for you. Why? I said the same thing I said when I bought an electric pen tester. Why didn't I buy this years ago? I don't know. Ask Ask the other Tim that didn't spend enough money on something that he should have, but life changer. There you go. I picked up a Canadian military sleep system. I can't wait to show it off. I'll probably do a little bit of a video on it. And it would, uh, yeah, it's cool. So my buddy that has the military surplus store right next to our daycare, what an awesome dude. It's called Luke Approved, named after his, uh, you know, his recently passed away dog. He had them for a hundred bucks. I looked online just to buy them at any other kind of surplus place was like $300. The only thing was, is that the outer layer, um, they had a cut in them that showed that they were taken out of stock. So his grandmother stitched them all up and they're perfect. Loved it. Anyway, so I will show that off at some point in the future. I'm going to take it with me. It'll work perfect with my tent, uh, my truck tent. Dave H, good to see you in here. Said you can use... An old bike inner tube to wrap around burst pipes. I've done it before and it did work for the most part. So yeah, I like that. Thank you for the tip, brother. Always appreciate it. Would we freeze dry this week? Hamburger, stewing beef, strawberries, and mixed fruit. Mixed fruit took longer than I figured because there was whole strawberries in them. It's been running for about 36 hours now. Now, if you guys remember last winter, Becky and I did a bunch of dry goods canning in five gallon buckets with the screw down lids, the gamma seal lids and mylar bags. Well, we got about halfway through it and then life got in the way like life does. So we ended up with about a, you know, half a year's supply of dry goods, which would have been good if it were evenly spread out. But what you ended up having was say lots of flour, but no rice, no beans or whatever. So we ended up deciding that we need to finish it before I head south, just for peace of mind. And so we picked up a bunch more buckets. We got some more bags coming and we've been gradually picking up the last of the dry stuff. So when we're done, we should be close to a year's supply of dry goods for the family, I think. So, you know, and folks say, well, you shouldn't talk about this stuff, Tim. Well, I have to, <laughs> you know, it's, it's what I do. I want folks to be motivated. It doesn't mean, here's the thing. At one time, when I was living on my own on the second floor of the Second Avenue apartment, when I didn't have a pot to piss in, I started prepping by having some jars of strawberry jam and mustard pickles. I don't even eat mustard pickles. What's wrong with you, Tim? And I thought I was prepped, but you know what? I was more prepped than I was the day before. And that's how we gradually moved to these things. So you can go from a few jars of pickles to, you know, a few dozen five gallon buckets full of dry food, right? That's what happens. We just work toward it. And only if we can make it work in our life too. Don't ever put yourself behind today for something that may or may not happen in the future, right? All right. I went to a restaurant supply store this week. I didn't buy anything, but I priced some stuff. And I was actually quite impressed with the prices. Because in the past, I found restaurant supply places tend to be a little bit higher priced. 
I started demolishing a bathroom over at the rental I've been working on. It's coming. My, it's taking me longer than I planned, but I'm shooting to have this rental done. This is my last rental renovation until fall. <laughs> We're going to start working on my son's place, but I got it done. I finally got our sewer line snaked and only took 12 days and about 17 phone calls between the insurance company and a bunch of guys who kept saying they were going to come and then they didn't. Kevin Humlovich here in town. What an awesome dude. I know he'll probably never hear this, but if anybody local from Provost is listening to this, he is the best guy to get a steamer in to snake a sewer line. He did went above and beyond cleaning up the mess that was down there. It was just, I want to tell you when somebody takes pride in their job, you got to respect them for it. I love it. Also, guess what? No, my biggest accomplishment of recent times. I haven't talked about it a lot on the podcast. If you're in the Camp Hope group, which is an offshoot of the workshop that Yozik started, where we encourage each other to lose weight, get healthy, quit smoking, whatever it happens to be. If you want an invite, let me know. Well, last Sunday, I ran my first 5K. So when I came home from Camden, Tennessee, Self-Reliance Festival last October, yeah, you know, walking a half an hour would wear me right out. Running for 30 seconds was enough to say, ooh, this old body's hurting. And I did, I just started randomly working a little more. I actually had started before I went, hurt my foot, blah, 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 excuse, excuse, and didn't keep going. But I enjoyed it. I realized I started liking it. So I started taking this coach to 5K. So basically sedentary to running a 5K program. It takes eight weeks to do. I took nine weeks to do it, I think, because... I paid attention to my body. If my, you know, if my quads were starting to hurt, I would take an extra day off because the last thing I wanted to do was hurt myself like last time. And now I'm running uh, 30 minutes, three times. So going forward, and I'm going to tell you guys this to keep me accountable, but uh, you know, uh, Monday and Wednesday, I'm running 30 minutes. And then each Saturday, I'm adding five more minutes to it. So the goal is to work my way up to an hour. <laughs> Isn't that insane? I couldn't even imagine. I feel better. I've got more energy. Uh, don't get winded. Hell yeah. Could I still use uh, to lose some weight? Yeah, I could. But I want to tell you, this old guy running around that track, however many times it takes to get there. I love it. I go early in the morning and it's quiet, except if the old folks are there. I fit right in anyway. So there you go. Uh, what do we have for content this week? We did the Wheel of MRE, which was a huge hit. Everybody seemed to love it. Alice had a ball with me. If you haven't seen it yet, we actually bought a spinning wheel where we put all the different MREs on it and we get to randomly pick which one we're going to eat. I did a review on the chamber vac and we did an awesome live stream with Kyle and Joe called slap the meat around. And if you haven't caught that, do yourself a favor, take a minute and give it a listen. If you have time this week, because man, that was a, I learned a ton about butchery. Yeah, I guess so. Also Kyle is applying for survivor. So if anybody out there from CBS is listening, you need to hire him. Bring him on. He'll be uh, an asset. <laughs> All right. Next. Next sponsor. Is this a sponsor? I don't know. If you guys noticed tonight in the YouTube comments, I pinned a link. If you're looking for a way to support the workshop, or actually the better way to position this is value for value exchange, because I'm a big fan of value for value exchange. So I launched the Patreon because a lot of folks are like, hey, I don't like patches or I'd like some exclusive content. So guess what? That's what we did. And so far this month, we had a, an in-person interview with Joel Salatin, which was the big kicker. I decided to put that on there. And a new show called Outside the Box that Alice and I are doing, where we go to places like Chinese grocery stores and pick up some exotic food to ourselves and test it out and see if it would be a viable prep. Anyway, five bucks a month for Patreon if you're interested. But more than that, I wanted to thank the folks that have subscribed so far. So we got Byron, we got Jeff, we got Bob, we got Roja, we got Brad and Ryan, and some crazy name, lady named Becky. So thank you guys. Thanks for putting your money where your mouth is, but thank you for supporting the cool shit that I get to do. And hopefully you enjoy it over there. They also get uh, typically ahead of time, the review videos, but the, the only guarantee I give is that they'll be ad free. So I upload them there so you don't have to watch them with YouTube ads as well. But anyway, thanks guys for the love and the support. Picked up a new member just today. So, all right. How about this? Repairedness. I don't think we've done a repairedness segment on this week in prepping yet. And for those who are new, because there's been quite a few new listeners recently, 
if you don't know what preparedness is, it's the air to home maintenance when help isn't around the corner. <laughs> it was my term that I coined. I really should, you know, copyright it or no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, so in Telegram this week, LOLK said uh, they had a question about 10 year smoke detectors and they wanted to know if they were dangerous because they have a lithium battery in them. And I just wanted to say, hell no, they're not dangerous at all because I use them all the time. <laughs> and then I thought, Tim, you know, pull your hackles back and do some actual reading and see what you find out. So what did I find out exactly? Because I have always been a proponent of 10 year smoke detectors. I tend to put them in to all of my uh, rentals. When I, when one wears out, I put it on the roof. I use those double-sided 3M Velcro strips that work great. And then with a Sharpie, I write the year and the month that I installed it and I put it up because it gives me peace of mind. All right. So what are the thoughts? Well, I did some digging and I found this study from the government of Connecticut, which is a really odd place to be doing a study on smoke detectors. Anyway, there is a ton of anecdotal evidence. And by anecdotal, I mean personal stories from folks who have had them who have said they don't last anywhere near 10 years. And in this study, they say the same thing. Not a majority, but a not insignificant amount of them did not last the full 10 years for the batteries. However, that tends to be the biggest concern is the false sense of security they give you. Now, how do we solve that? Well, by doing regular smoke detector tests as well. So if you're like me, you just burn your toast and you know your smoke detector's working. But if you're like a sensible person who knows how to properly toast bread, then you just go around once every two or three months, push the test button, drive your chihuahuas nuts, scare your kids half to death because you didn't warn them. And then you know, hey, I'm good for another two to three months. So if you're worried about lithium, there were very, very limited situations where one did catch fire or a couple did catch fire. So if that's an issue for you, there's also a company that has 10-year alkaline batteries uh, built into smoke detectors as well. So something to think about. I still 100% believe that the 10-year smoke detectors are worth both the cost and the, the benefit of having them. However, they're not without their negatives. Test them on a regular basis. Keep an eye on them because everything fails. Anything with a battery. The other thing I found out is they don't like 100% humidity and they also don't like to be below 4 degrees Celsius or above 35 degrees Celsius. So really hot, really cold, or really damp, going to shorten the life immensely. So I hope that helps. And like I said, if a person is nervous about having a lithium battery strapped to the roof in their home, doesn't seem like it should be that big of a deal, but if it is, you can buy alkaline alternatives. And that's this company here that I ended up finding. I believe this is what LOL shared in Telegram. It's a company called Universal Security Instruments, and they have Duracell alkaline 10-year batteries. I thought it was kind of cool. I'm going to guess that you pay a premium for them, but if anybody was interested, I wanted to share it with you. So there you go. I like that one. This one was shared in the Telegram group as well. It's now time for the community, sorry, the creator spotlight. This is where I share with you guys somebody that tickles my fancy. It could be an author, it could be a audiobook, or in this case, it could be a YouTube channel. And if you haven't seen this guy, I'm sure you probably have. It's Jerry Rig Everything, and he has 8.4 million subscribers. Not that I need to, you know, promote him at all, but... His link is in the description. Turns out that he just did a bunker build as well. It was uh, quite a bit cheaper than some of the bigger built bunker builds you've seen. Try to say that bigger bunker build five times fast. So if anybody's interested, he has an entire playlist that started about two months ago building this bunker. So check it out. Obviously, I won't play it because I don't want to, you know, steal his content. But there it is. He did quite an interesting bunker build. Yeah. All right. What do we got next? Well, Tim, let's dig into the community nail bag. Did you say nail bag? I did. Tim, you don't need to say that every time you do this, but I think I do. Here we are. So the nail bag, what is the nail bag? Well, it's really just a funny way to say mail bag because this is the workshop and we carry around a nail bag with us, isn't it? So what do you have for us this week, Tim? Well, I'm glad you asked. So this one came from Robin via email. Uh, she's a recent follower and I uh, really appreciate the support she's been sending me sent me, I, I got to tell you this, guys. 
I'm an optimist, but I also am a skeptic. So when I get articles that have a really interesting title to them, my bullshit meter goes off. <laughs> now, hang in there. I'm not calling um, anyone a bullshit spreader. I'm not. But this was a really funny article that when I seen it, I thought, because it was a screenshot. You know how you see screenshots on Twitter, or Instagram, and you're like, there's no way that's a real article. Well, let me tell you, folks. There was a way that this was a real article, and it blew me out of the water. All right. This is from the Cooldown. That is the Cooldown.com. Had never heard of them before. I honestly thought it looked like it was a satire site. I did some digging. It doesn't appear they're a satire site. At least, I hope not. And if they are, I guess the joke's on me, but I couldn't find it. Disturbing report reveals horrifying effects of Texas border wall proof that border barriers are death traps. We are only fearful that this will become a more common story. So this was the headline of the article. Over 100 frogs, snakes, and spiders, and more, were burned alive last summer after raging wildfires slept through, swept through southern Texas. These creatures likely could have escaped if not obstructed by a long stretch of concrete border wall. Okay, so they... Uh, when I looked at this, the, the article didn't say how many, and then you scroll down, it's like about 100 creatures. Now, is that an awful thing? Sure. Do creatures get killed in wire fire, wildfires all the time? Also sure. Hang in there, though. Are you ready for this? This is where this article takes a left turn. While the concrete... <sighs> I don't know how you can read this and not be blown away. While the concrete border wall is believed to have stopped the fire from spreading into the city of Greneo, as Hidalgo County Fire Marshal told my RGV, it's also believed to kept over 100 animals from escaping, according to the Guardian. The animals killed included frogs, cane toads, tarantula spiders, and a cuckoo. Is it awful? Yes. However, how do you read this and position this article as... A hundred little creatures died when the real story is it actually managed to keep the city from burning down or at least catching fire. I thought this was a bullshit article. It's not. That kind of blew me out of the water. Jeremy says there's more than that many snakes in any block in Houston. Uh, so to follow up, Robin sent me her real world experience about this. And this is the only bit that I'm going to talk about the border wall this evening because we've already dealt with it. But she said, hey, I just wanted to, they said, I just wanted to add some firsthand experience. My husband and I owned a deer camp near the Texas border. We loved going there, hiking the property and enjoying the quiet country life. Late night star stargazing and campfires. That actually sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> then the border opened wide up. Someone tried to break into our home. To prevent that from happening again, I had to do something that I said I would never do. I had to start buying and leaving food and water out for the illegals. We would arrive at our camp to see the food had been eaten, but thankfully the illegals had eaten and moved on. These were the gutaways, the people that didn't want to make contact with Border Patrol. We were pulled over more once by Border Patrol and warned to get off the road for our own safety. If someone passed us at a high rate of speed because there was a chase happening, we had heard stories of innocent people being killed by these high-speed chases. We saw a Texas... Depart, uh, DPS performing these chases. Anyway, after our neighbors had gotten broken into numerous times, I never felt safe on our property again. I could no longer hike and enjoy our camp. We traveled our trails and slept with a gun within reach. We finally just give up our property, um, give up that our property would ever be safe or a quiet country home that we enjoyed. We sadly sold out. Isn't that a sin? So that was the real life story. And it kind of followed up with the, uh, as Chris Dixon says, spin it, baby, spin it. And that's exactly what they did. I, This is one of the worst cases of new spin I've ever seen, and it blew me out of the water. So pay attention. Read to the bottom of it. If, if you're going to share an image, read to the bottom like Robin did and uh, let you know because, holy cow, I can't even imagine. So thank you, Robin, for sharing that. I wanted you guys to get an up close because – it's pretty hard to be in North America and be any further away from the Texas border crisis than East Central Alberta. I mean, I guess you could go to like Nunavut or the Arctic Ocean, but I'm pretty damn close to being that far. So it was nice or 
refreshing to hear a real world experience, not that it's good or bad, just sucks. So there you go. How about this? Reach into the community nail bag one more time. And uh, this came from last week's episode uh, when I was speaking with the, the night when we were talking about slapping the meat around. And I asked the boys, I said, is self-reliance a myth? And I was, you know, I was kind of leading them on a little bit because I really didn't believe that it was a myth. But what I believed was absolute self-reliance might not be an attainable goal for most folks. And so Starfleet, Starfleet Command responded on YouTube and they said, Replicator, self-reliance is almost impossible except without, or without a, re a replicator. Get a replicator. You'll never run out of anything. A phaser and a cloak is helpful too. I really appreciated that comment. I don't know why. I'm a Trekkie. I thought it was hilarious. I'm not sure if they were busting my balls or just being funny. Doesn't really matter. Either way, I enjoyed that comment. <laughs> This one comes from Daniel over on Telegram. He said, hey, Tim, what are you using for audio editing for your podcast and where do you host? Well, that's easy. I use Audible for editing. Actually, I don't edit really most nights. As you, you guys will know, you hear it with all the foibles included, including sometimes when I forget to turn audio up or down. Should I edit a little bit? Perhaps. But I kind of like the live the live radio. You get the, uh, you know, the Memrex experience right then and there. So anyway, yeah. So I do use, I said Audible. Audacity. Oh my God. Audacity is freeware on Windows. I don't know if it's available on other systems or not, but it's perfect. It's just difficult enough that it doesn't take that long to learn, but it's simple enough that it doesn't take that long to learn. So give it a shot. And then I, where do I host? Well, it's now Spotify. It used to be Anchor, but they merged or changed the name, but it's Spotify for podcasts. I now have 421 episodes up there. I also, yes, Two is one, one is none, three is a guarantee. I keep hard copies on my computer of every episode, but they haven't cut me off yet. So I don't know where they stop you from uploading, but they've been really good to me so far. All right, what's next? Uh, last question from the community. And this comes from a Hard Ass Jackson channel, 16971. What a name. I love YouTube usernames, don't you? And this was in regards to inverter generators. And I thought this was important enough to answer on the show. And they said, hey, do inverter generators also give off carbon monoxide? Yep. Yes, they do. Just in case you're wondering. So I thought, you know, I wanted to chuckle a little bit. I was like, oh, why would you chuckle at that? It's not, a, there's no such thing as a stupid question at all. That's the type of thing that a lot of people are like, I never thought to ask that question. And you know what? Somebody, that might save somebody's life someday. The fact that Hard Ass Jackson Channel, 16971, was willing to ask that question. So if anybody's out there thinking, I'll get an inverter generator because the fumes will be less or I can run it in an, an enclosed space without proper ventilation or a carbon monoxide detector, you cannot. You need to treat it just like any other, you know, gas burning device. Simple as that. So, Yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. I love this, guys. We I actually included some of the mailbag, nail bag in earlier segments of the show, so it wouldn't be super long at the very end. But I hope you guys enjoyed that. I, I know I did. I um, Yeah, I love putting these episodes together. I try to keep them to about 90 minutes because that seems to be, you know, I had an old pastor who taught me in college. He said, remember this, Tim. He said, the mind can only absorb what the ass can endure. And Thinking back on it, that's kind of a funny saying, but he's right. If you keep people down, it doesn't matter how enthralled and how entertaining you might be or how ravishingly good looking like myself, eventually people are going to get tired of your voice, aren't they? So anyway, <laughs> so what's coming up this week, folks? Well, tomorrow is Groundhog Day. We're not actually going to do anything special this year. We, we've celebrated Groundhog Day for the last three or four years as a workshop. I'm going to be on the road. Uh, my daughter is going to a really big provincial wide volleyball tournament, which I'm excited for Charlotte. And we're going to kind of use it as a mini, not really vacation. I don't know what you'd call it, but this Sunday evening, we have EMT Don coming back on. And if you guys, he's, this will be his third appearance. He's my brother from another mother. He has some stories to share, but I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but what he wants to talk about Sunday evening, it's going to be deep. It's going to be from the heart, and it's going to be what he's been dealing with recently. And I didn't ask him to come on. He reached out to me, and he, of his own volition, and wanted to come on. So make sure you're here, guys. Mark it, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. We will be on live. 
Tomorrow, there is a brand new episode of Delinquent's Gully Chronicles. It'll be episode seven. And I hate to say it, but there's only going to be one more episode before I get back down to Tennessee. There'll be episode eight, and that's where it'll end until I get you guys some new footage. So enjoy it. And in the meantime, Alice and I will be putting up the wheel of MREs until we run out of MREs to eat because we've been having a hell of a time with it. And it's a great way to get my daughter involved. So folks, you know, I love you. I think you guys, the craziest bunch of delinquents this side of the nut house, aren't we? So anyway, thanks for coming in. Thanks for making this one of the highlights of the week, every single week, get out there and do absolutely everything you can to make the world your bitch. <laughs> now, really build your empire, folks. Do it, do it, do it. And with that, what do I say? As always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. And as we close, Darkwing Dave just said, if you didn't know, Steve Smith is being inducted into the Canadian Comedy, Comedy Hall of Fame as a writer and performer. I opened the show with that news, and Darkwing Dave, take it away. I think it's perfect that we close with honors to Mr. Red Green. So take easy, guys, and as always, once again, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. <laughs>